I've been thinking lately about damped harmonic oscillators, and I came across a couple of interesting results that I thought would be worth sharing. And so I'm going to do that, I'm going to make a couple of videos on oscillators, and my aim, for now at least, is not to go over the basic theory of, for example, how to solve the equations of motion. I might do that in the future. But for now, um, I just want to cover a few very specific results. And the first thing I want to talk about is overshoot, and specifically overshoot in critically damped systems. And what I mean by overshoot is, let's say you have a mass on a spring, and you release the mass um, from some initial position, um, if it overshoots, that means it goes through the equilibrium position and then comes back towards equilibrium. Okay, so it crosses the equilibrium position. And in my experience, it's a fairly common misconception that if you have a critically damped or heavily damped system, um, then it will never overshoot. And now that's true if you release your mass from rest, but actually if you give it a big enough initial velocity, then it will overshoot. And what I want to do in this video is derive the condition um, in terms of the initial displacement and velocity, derive the condition for overshoot to occur. So to start with, let's just have a very brief review of um, the equation of motion and the solution in the critically damped case. So if we um, apply Newton's second law to a mass spring system, we're going to get mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx is zero, okay, where m is the mass, um, <clears throat> b is the damping coefficient, and k is the spring constant of the spring. Now we often rewrite this in the form x double dot plus 2 gamma x dot plus omega naught squared x is zero, where I've defined gamma to be b over 2m and omega naught squared to be k over m. Now, the reason for defining these constants should become clear in a moment. These constants gamma and omega naught squared. Um, so if you want to solve this equation for x, usually what we do is just try a trial solution. So we say, let's say x is proportional to e to the lambda t, where lambda is some constant. Then we need to figure out what value of lambda makes this solution work. And to do that, we just plug it back into the, into the equation of motion. And so you'll notice that when you differentiate x, you just bring down a factor of lambda. And when you differentiate that again, you're going to have a factor of lambda squared in the front. Right? So if we take this solution and plug it into the equation of motion, you'll end up with lambda squared plus 2 gamma lambda plus omega naught squared all multiplied by e to the lambda t is equal to zero. Now, because um, e to the lambda t can never be equal to zero, um, we can deduce that this quadratic expression in terms of lambda has to be zero. And so if we solve that um, by completing the square or um, using the quadratic formula, you will find that lambda is equal to minus gamma plus or minus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared. And now you can kind of see why we defined these constants gamma and omega naught uh, the way we did, because it makes um, lambda come out in this nice neat way, rather than doing everything in terms of b, m, and k. So this um, form of lambda is why we get different regimes of oscillation. We've got light damping, critical damping, and heavy damping, depending on how gamma compares with omega naught. Now, the critically damped case is when gamma is exactly equal to omega naught, and um, so you can see that when gamma is exactly equal to omega naught, you only have one distinct solution for lambda, right? Lambda is equal to minus gamma. And when you're solving second-order differential equations, if you find this repeated root um, for lambda, then the general solution is um, x equals a plus bt, um, and then e to the lambda t, where lambda is your, your unique solution. Okay. Where, and then th these constants a and b depend on the initial conditions of the problem. So here lambda is equal to um, minus gamma, right? So this is our general solution in the critically damped case. So 
Now let's think about how to find the values of a and b. So let's say at t equals 0, so x at t equals 0 is some constant x0, okay, and we can then use that fact to get a constraint on a and b. So if I apply that constraint to this equation um, on the line above, we're going to find that x0 is equal to um, just a, right, because this, we put t equals 0 um, into this uh, expression, and um, therefore the b term vanishes. Okay. Now, what about the velocity? So let's think about what the velocity is by differentiating our expression for x. So we've got x dot, and then we can use the product rule um, to find the expression for the velocity, right? And so if we first um, differentiate the first term, a plus b t, we just get b. So we're going to get b e to the minus gamma t, and then we differentiate the second term, this exponential term, and so we're going to get an additional minus gamma a plus b t e to the minus gamma t. Um, and if we take out the common factor of e to the minus gamma t, um, we get b minus gamma a um, minus gamma b t, all multiplied by e to the minus gamma t. Okay. Now, let's say um, your initial velocity is v0, okay? So if I say that x dot at t equals 0 is v0, what does that imply? Um, <clears throat> well, we can say that v0 is equal to b minus gamma a, right? Because this um, gamma b t term disappears if t is 0, and um, e to the minus gamma t is just 1 when t is 0. So uh, we found that x0 is a, or a is x0, um, and therefore we know that v0 um, is going to be equal to b minus gamma x0, right? And therefore um, b is equal to v0 plus gamma x0. So we found, found our uh, constants a and b from the initial conditions. So that means our general solution, sorry, not our general solution, but our specific solution now is going to be um, x equals um, x0 plus v0 plus gamma x0 t times e to the minus gamma t. Okay, so um, let's think about what we need to happen in order for us to get overshoot, okay? So if there is um, overshoot, that means at some point x has to be zero, right? Because that's the definition of overshoot. It crosses the equilibrium position, which is x equals zero. So, um, so let me write, if there is overshoot, then we have x equals zero for some particular time t, okay? And so, if x is 0, again, this exponential term can never be 0, so that would imply that x0 plus v0 plus gamma x0 t is 0 for some value of t. Um, and so the value of t that would make that work is, of course, t is minus x0 over um, v0 plus gamma x0. So um, let's think about what this means, right? So if there's overshoot, we need to have a value of t which is positive because we start at t equals 0, and so if it overshoots at some point after the motion has begun, then we need to have a positive solution um, for t, right? And so there are two different cases we can think about that would make t positive. Um, so let me write here that um, we need t to be bigger than zero in order to have a, um, a crossing of the equilibrium position at some point after the motion starts, right? So there are two, two possible cases. Um, and the first one is, let's say um, x naught is bigger than zero, 
right? So the numerator of this fraction um, is negative because x0 is bigger than 0 and the numerator is minus x0. If x0 is bigger than 0, then we need to have the denominator being less than 0, right? Because you would need to have, um, in order to make t positive, you need to have a negative number divided by another negative number. Okay, so if x0 is bigger than 0, that means v0 plus gamma x0 has to be less than 0. Okay, and we can write that alternatively as v0 is less than minus gamma x0. Okay, and the other case would be if x0 is negative, right? In that case, um, the numerator would be positive because it's minus x0, which means the denominator would also have to be positive. So we would then have v0 plus gamma x0 is bigger than 0, or um, v0 is bigger than minus gamma x0. Okay, and... The other possibility that we could have is x0 is equal to 0, right? But then we would find that the only solution for t is just t equals 0. So if you start it from the, um, the equilibrium position, so that x0 is 0, then the only solution for t is t equals 0, so it's not going to come back through equilibrium, right? So to get overshoot, um, you need to have um, either of these two cases being satisfied. So to get a bit more insight about what this actually means, I'm going to sketch a graph up here. So let me draw some axes. And um, these are x0 and v0. So this is the parameter space of the initial conditions. Okay, And I'm going to represent graphically these two cases. So let's think about the first case. Um, so if x0 is positive, then we need to have v0 less than minus gamma x0. So I'm going to sketch another line on here, um, which is going to look like this. And this is the line of v0 equals minus gamma x0, right? This is just like y is some negative gradient um, times x. And note that gamma is always positive, right? So this line slopes downwards. So if we're on the right-hand side of um, this graph, so anywhere to the right of the v0 axis, then we need to basically be in this part um, of the parameter space, right? We can't be here, and we can't be here, because in that case, v0 would not be less than minus gamma x0. Um, so how about on the other side, when x0 is negative, we still are interested in this same line of v0 equals minus gamma x0, but now if x0 is negative, we have to be above the line, right? So we can be here, but not here, and not here. And so you might be able to see that what that means is we can actually rewrite these cases as, um, so for overshoots to occur, for overshoots to occur, we need to have the modulus of v0 is greater than uh, gamma times the modulus of x0, right? So I've kind of combined these two conditions um, into one statement. So we need to have the modulus of v0 being bigger than gamma times the modulus of x0, and um, the initial, initial velocity must be directed towards the origin. Okay, so basically it has to be moving fast enough and it has to be uh, moving towards the origin um, in order for overshoot to occur. Okay, so that's it. That's the result. Um, so as long as these um, conditions are satisfied, you will get overshoot in a critically damped system. Um, and so there is actually a nice um, physical interpretation of this result. Um, and you can actually argue in just um, one or two lines about why you would expect this result v0 bigger than gamma x0, why you would expect that to be the case. Um, and I'm going to cover that physical interpretation um, in, I think, two videos' time. 
So in my next video, I'm going to do a similar analysis, but for the heavy damping case.